Great. We're off and running. Steve, you've got a presentation for us, I guess? Or well, I do. Ken, do you want, do you want to say a few words of introduction, and then I can go through the details? That sounds like a good idea. Okay. So um, tonight is the public hearings for the first of the two required public hearings for the select board to consider um, this update to the town's municipal plan. Um, the Planning Commission worked on this over a number of months. It was, uh, it was designed and considered to be a brief update looking for us to um, update sections of the plan um, that needed to be updated to remain in compliance with state law. But what it's not intended to be was a wholesale opening up the plan, rewriting the whole thing, which was something that we did five years ago. Um, five years ago, we had a very elaborate public engagement process um, with surveys and um, significant outreach to the public. This particular time, um, we, we didn't do that. There was public outreach, but it was much more focused. We had some input from um, the Conservation Commission, for example, uh, extensive input from um, Revitalizing Waterbury, um, and uh, other people participated. We had numerous people attending the meetings. But the parts of the plan that we really looked <laughs> to update and focused on were, number one, um, having a, a revised energy plan and energy chapter, which is really intended to help the town have um, enhanced status when um, energy projects go before the Public Service Board. So the hope is, the goal is, that the town would be given what's called substantial deference under state law. We're not exactly sure what substantial deference means, but it's probably going to be more than what we had in the past. Um, there were some other things that we did um, as part of uh, the plan. One was we updated the natural resources chapter, um, and this had to do with a new planning requirement for forest fragmentation. So that you know, was, was the natural place, if you use that, that word, for that to be. Um, since the town plan was last approved, we no longer have two separate governments here in Waterbury. So it used to be there was the village, a separate government, and the town, which was a separate government. So now we just have one town government. And so we had to go through the plan to um, change language to reflect that, 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 that those are a changed set of circumstances for the town. Um, there were a few other things that um, we updated in response to some input that we got from the public, um, including updating some of the data in the local economy section. Um, I mentioned we updated some language having to do with local government. And um, there were some action items that were added um, in attempt to, uh, number one, help the town deal with things like visual impacts. Um, and there's also uh, an action item pertaining to the Shootsville Hill area and um, uh, the sensitive areas around that. And again, that was part of some of the conversations we had with folks from um, the Conservation Commission. So that's sort of an overview. And Steve, you're going to dive into the details. Yeah, I'll make this presentation fairly brief. I've got an outline here if um, anybody would like a copy. And uh, oh, pass that down to Jane. Sure. Uh, yeah. And so there's some extra copies here. Tell oh, maybe you could just set those up at the corner of the table. And um, so I'm going to uh, just go through a brief uh, presentation. I've got about 10 or 11 slides to um, illustrate <coughs> some of the points that uh, Ken has made. And uh, the Planning Commission uh, approved this draft back on um, August 27th and uh, transmitted it to the select board, presented it to the select board. Uh, the process moving forward will be to incorporate any comments from uh, this uh, hearing. The select board can make substantive changes at this point. So, um, so they can um, 
direct the Planning Commission if uh, they want help. The Planning Commission can assist them, but it's really in your court, in the Select Board's court. And then uh, there'll be one more public hearing uh, in, scheduled for early December. The Select Board has to cover, uh, has to uh, have two public hearings, and then, um, then they vote on uh, whether or not to adopt this plan. And at this point, it will become an eight-year plan. We're on a five-year cycle now, but with a uh, new state statute that was uh, passed a few years ago, it will now be on a, an eight-year cycle with a four-year check-in with the Regional Planning Commission. So uh, the purpose of this current draft is to update the municipal plan, as Ken mentioned, which is expiring on December 9th of this year. So uh, that's why we're on this fairly uh, tight schedule. And then um, this updated draft plan is uh, fo focused on the selected chapters that Ken mentioned and the statistics to be consistent with uh, the requirements in state statute, uh, including the two new requirements for energy and uh, natural resources addressing forest fragmentation. So uh, let's just talk briefly about the goals in state statute. Um, these are selected goals. There are others in um, section 4302 of the uh, of 24 VSA. That's the book 24. And uh, to plan development to maintain the historic settlement pattern of compact village and urban centers separated by rural countryside. That's kind of, kind of the tenant of uh, planning in Vermont and it's incorporated into state statute. Uh, to provide a strong and diverse economy that provides job opportunities and maintains high environmental standards. To encourage the efficient use of energy and the development of renewable energy resources of the new energy plan and uh, the uh, updated or rewritten energy chapter is designed to address that goal. And then a uh, goal to protect natural and scenic resources and minimize forest fragmentation. So I'm just going to go through the presentation and then turn it back over to Chris uh, for, for public comment and uh, questions uh, and so on. So uh, these are the, the chapters that uh, we focused on, as Ken mentioned. Uh, chapter four, the local economy. Um, Alyssa Johnson uh, helped us with this. Uh, this is a picture of revitalizing Waterbury's uh, business fair a couple of years ago. Uh, so the revisions include new text and recent statistics that have been added in part to reflect the recovery from tropical storm Irene. Uh, this chapter also discusses uh, revitalizing Waterbury's role, including the creation of the Economic Development Strategic Plan in 2017, which <clears throat> was endorsed by the Select Board. Um, it's not incorporated in the municipal plan. It's not a requirement to have this plan. Uh, it's more of an advisory plan from the municipal perspective, but um, it is something that uh, the Planning Commission participated in and is an important part of revitalizing Waterbury's economic program. Um, we mentioned natural resources, that's chapter six, and uh, revisions include additional text to address forest fragmentation as required in the state's uh, Act 171 that was passed in um, last year in 2017. Um, the new forest resources and connectivity map, which is 2-7, uh, is, is referenced in this chapter. And I think it's important to note that um, the requirements in States Act 171 is not decided, is not um, designed to prevent development. It's designed to minimize impact to forest resources. Uh, with the understanding that um, you know, there will be some impact uh, over time with development, with logging, with uh, other activities, and the idea is to minimize that impact. And uh, the uh, new language in the plan is, is really consistent with that. Uh, the Planning Commission uh, added this map with assistance from the Regional Planning Commission. Uh, this is uh, called Forest Resources and Connectivity. And uh, the, the shaded areas depict uh, forested areas in Waterbury. There are um, a couple different categories of um, interior forest blocks, uh, both of a high priority and a um, 
more of a regular priority. And then there's also the purple area that you see um, right up in uh, this area. This is North Hill. This is the Shootsville Hill area. And that's um, what uh, this data calls a wildlife connectivity area, a um, high priority. And then there are also wildlife crossings on roads, which are depicted in red, which typically connect two forested areas. So this is really um, designed to be an inventory map. There's, um, at this point, there's nothing regulatory about it. We do regulate uh, areas over 1,200 feet through our Ridgeline Hillside Steep Slope regulations. And uh, certainly minimizing forest fragmentation is already part of, uh, of those regulations. Energy, uh, we work very closely with Duncan McDougall and uh, with your colleagues at, at, at Waterbury Leap. Uh, Waterbury Leap, I think, is just a terrific organization. We're very fortunate, and they provided us with uh, a lot of good input. This is the solar array that Ben and Jerry's installed. It's about a half a megawatt array, and you can see the plant uh, over the top of the solar panels there in Hunger Mountain. And, um, then the municipality also has a half a megawatt facility up in the well field on Sweet Road. And uh, solar has, has really become the predominant renewable energy generation uh, source in Waterbury along with hydro. Um, and uh, the municipality even is in on the Hydro Act with a little uh, micro generator in our, um, in our uh, water supply line on Guptal Road. So, um, we worked on the energy plan with the Central Mont Regional Planning Commission that's uh, attached as Appendix B. And um, the, the chapter, the energy chapter and the energy plan are intended to address the standards in the state's Act 174. Uh, we, we have to address those standards. The energy plan is optional for municipalities. It's required for regional planning commissions to have an energy plan. But for us, it's, it's optional, but it does help us in looking at um, where, we, where we would like to see renewables and uh, where we want to discourage them. Uh, this is the solar resources map. Uh, it's a little hard to see from your vantage point, but there are two different uh, tones. There's primary, where there are no, um, no environmental or natural constraints uh, that are known. And then there are secondary sites that are possible constraints where um, the uh, natural resources need to be investigated to make sure that, uh, that that's a suitable site. And uh, these are the known constraints. Uh, they're built into the energy plan. They're things like uh, vernal pools, which are a form of wetland, river corridors, floodways, uh, rare threatened and endangered species sites, and um, class one and two wetlands. So we, we really try to discourage uh, the installation of um, facilities, in this case, in solar. And there are other maps in the plan that deal with wind, biomass, uh, and, and so on, hydro. So that's an example of, of the maps that are in there. Uh, this is a picture of our new uh, phosphorus removal facility. It's a little dark, but um, the drawing beds are on the right, and the control building is um, in the, in the back. And um, so <clears throat> in the facilities chapter, we, um, we focus quite a bit on the creation of, <coughs> excuse me, of the Edward for our utility district. <coughs> and I think um, most of you know that <coughs> this uh, utility district assumed ownership of the former village of Waterbury municipal assets and manages them now. And they include the uh, public uh, water and wastewater systems, and of course the plant is a big part of that asset. And then the, the chapter also addresses the provision of townwide police services um, with the um, beginning of our townwide police force with the contract with, uh, with the state police. Local government, um, clearly we now have a new scenario with the village of Waterbury no longer existing as a municipality. So this chapter uh, bill helped us uh, to completely rewrite and update that chapter, bring it up to date. Uh, land use, which is the last chapter in the plan, uh, revisions include text addressing forest fragmentation and the implications for land development. Uh, this, um, I'll show you the, the land use map here in 
just a minute. And um, so again, this is not intended to prevent development. It's really tend to, uh, intended to concentrate development in suitable areas and to minimize uh, impacts to the forested areas uh, in our town. This is a picture of the Harvey Farm. Um, good example of a planned unit development. And, um, shows up on some of the state brochures as a uh, poster child, if you will, for uh, what you might say is good development. And then uh, future land use map, we mentioned um, this uh, forest area, which was our, uh, our conservation and forest area previously, just to focus on uh, some of the uh, goals there. And then we have our two growth centers. So, so I think, yeah, Steve, but yeah, uh, before we get out of onto the next chapter there, um, Act 171, is there anything that you could tell us um, about the state's rules or considerations that uh, may be, uh, may help us out here with um, understanding perhaps what they, what they're looking for, um, you know, okay. as far as what is it that they're trying to achieve here in a nutshell? Um, I understand the forest fragmentation issue, but I mean, it, they've gone to the extent to uh, put together this Act 171, and I'm just, is there anything you, you can tell us that uh, may give us the highlights of what that's about? Well, I think the, the science behind it, and clearly Vermont has gone from uh, being probably all forested in pre-colonial times to being largely cleared in early colonial times and 70% uh, or more cleared to now uh, 70 to 80% forested. And I think that the goal of the act is to look at, especially at wildlife that are dependent on interior forest areas, everything from bears to interior dwelling birds, and make sure that, that um, those blocks of habitat be uh, remain viable for, for the wildlife. And um, I think the focus in the Shootsville Hill area is a, is a good example where that's a, connect, a connection between the main spine of the Green Mountains and the um, Worcester Range. So some areas are more critical than others for wildlife, but I think that uh, that's really the science behind it. I think from our perspective, it's really a matter of appropriate development. And I, I think our Ridgeline Hillside Steep Slope regulations are a, a good example of how we address that through uh, the regulatory process. And um, there's, there's no prohibition on development, but it definitely uh, encourages development in suitable areas and tries to minimize the, the amount of clearing in some, some of these critical areas. Okay. Does that help? Yeah. I mean, I was just hoping to maybe shed a little bit more light on it for the, for the public as right. a whole, you know. Right. But I think it is, uh, you know, from a, a state perspective, it's really based on a lot of the uh, research and um, of the, the state's goal to try to protect some of these uh, essential interior areas to support the, the wildlife that depends on those, especially the connecting areas in water areas. Shootsville Hill is a good example. And what I would add to that, Chris, is that um, what sometimes happens with the state's planning enabling legislation is there may be um, there may be a new required element, but a municipality like Waterbury, for example, may already have been doing some things that address at least partially those concerns. And so what you end up having to do um, at minimum is to repackage what you are already doing to use the magic words that have now been, we've been told that need to be used and, and you know, perhaps even include that in a chapter. Here's how we're dealing with forest fragmentation, where in the, in the past, we may have used a whole very different vocabulary. So that's, that's at least part of it. The other is, is there's a, um, what, what the state wants us to do is to do, have some mapping that's part of it. And I think we, we probably already had some of that, but where you're mapping out your forested areas and you have some other strategies that, that you can say, Here, here's some things that we're doing to try to help to you know, minimize the breaking up of, of forested land. At the end of the day, um, the plan has to be passed by the Regional Planning Commission. 
And so ultimately that's the litmus test for whether or not our plan um, has done an adequate job to address those things the state says they want us to address. Yeah, we can talk a little bit more about it when we turn it over to the public, but I appreciate that uh, explanation. Um, it's one of the areas that I have concern about, you know, being, being in the business I am, uh, I've, we fragment the forest quite often and it, it does bother me a bit, you know. Uh, in doing what we do, um, it's kind of a consequence of the, of the work we do. And, uh, and there's some issues there that we can talk about a little bit later that, uh, you know, it's the pros and cons of it. So, thank you. Okay. See. You know, I just add, you know, not all forest fragmentation is, is a bad thing. Right. I mean, there are, there are species like deer that require browse. And so uh, certainly in, uh, you know, in logging in particular, by nature, it fragments the forest. And it's a matter of how you do it, where you do it, making sure that there's winter habitat. So I, I think it's, um, it's not a black and white science at all, but uh, one that we, we address. And, uh, as Ken mentioned, uh, we, we've had the Regional Planning Commission review the plan already and take a look at some of this language and recommend. Uh, they've made comments. We've incorporated language to address their comments. Yeah, I guess that's my point. I mean, frag forest fragmentation isn't always detrimental to wildlife. I mean, it's detrimental to certain species of wildlife. Uh, and that's why I was kind of questioning what the state's goals were here, if they were, you know, basically picking out and, and uh, trying to suggest, uh, you know, reducing the amount of fragmentation to protect X. You know, what, what species are they concerned about that the fragmentation is uh, impacting? And, and uh, uh, you know, what limits are those species at? And um, just kind of those types of things that might give us uh, more incentive to maybe look at those areas and, and being more protective of them. I, I don't think it was that specific. Yeah, well, that's why I asked. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. That, and that doesn't surprise me. Although, <laughs> I, I, although I mean, having um, said that about it not being that specific, I think this whole thing, I, I know that the Shootsville Hill area is has been identified and it came up certainly when we had um, some issues recently about um, the Verizon Tower. Um, the ANR has identified it as a critical wildlife crossing, and it has to do with large mammal movement and being able to connect uh, different habitat areas. And by severing that connectivity, you definitely impact the um, not only the migration, but um, ability to reproduce and have more genetic diversity. So um, I think some of it is very specific. So it's important to understand that our town is, is part of that. Um, just happens to have that connectivity right on the edge of our town, up in the Stowe area, so. Well, it's just uh, a coincidence that today I was working for a gal who works in the conservation department for the state, and she said that one of her uh, goals was to, uh, they're actually working on that uh, particular seg segment of forest right now, trying to achieve easements mm -hmm. to uh, put, put off um, you know, the ability for development. And of course, that was always been one of my concerns as part of the municipal plan, you know, uh, the zoning part of it uh, or the, z the zoning regulations still allow for housing development in that area, which kind of seems uh, like an oxymoron to what we're trying to seems achieve like there. It's at odds with uh, the goal of trying right. to exactly. yeah. prevent a fragmentation. I'd also say that as um, climate change impacts us, um, animals are going to be moving and seeking out uh, food and maybe places that they haven't in the past. So that's another reason to um, try to prevent forest fragmentation. Okay. Well, we probably should let Steve <laughs> get no. through this and then we'll... Uh... No, that's fine. Um, I'll just make one more comment and then I think it'd be good to get some input from the public. Um, on this uh, forest resource and connectivity map, there are these uh, blue or um, blue-green areas, which are the riparian areas. And uh, these areas are, are critical for wildlife 
migration. And um, this came out when we did our study of our ridgeline hillside steep slope um, areas back in 2000, around 2005. We did a, a natural resource uh, study and inventory of our higher elevation areas. So I just wanted to point out that this map also um, maps these areas. And uh, the plan does talk about um, limiting development in the in the riparian areas, floodplain areas, and and so on, and, and they're they're important all the way up into the you know from low elevations into higher elevations. Uh, some of you may have seen some of the uh, mapping of wildlife movement where they've put collars on uh, bobcats and other wildlife, and and the uh, the patterns. It's amazing how they follow these streams, especially in open areas. So I just wanted to make that point as well. Okay. Um, so are you through your, yeah, your short presentation? Yeah. Okay. And uh, I guess at this point, uh, we can turn it over to the public that's here and see if they got any concerns, comments, uh, suggestions. Um, so feel free to come up to the mic and speak if you have anything you'd like to say. Duncan McDougall, and I'm one of the volunteers who works with Waterbury Leap, and we are very appreciative that the Planning Commission had asked us for our input, we are happy to provide. And uh, we were really impressed with the document that was put together with regard to the energy plan. Uh, but having worked with organizations that have put together long, extensive plans like this in the past, uh, I know from experience that if you don't have some mechanism to follow through, uh, that most of the things that are recommended in the plan just aren't going to happen. They're, they're nice words on the paper, um, but we, we really feel strongly about them, which we certainly do. Um, I would strongly recommend that the select board and the planning commission come up with a small group of folks, maybe one representative from the planning commission, one from LEAP, one from the Central Water Mutual Planning Commission, whatever it might be, a core group who gets together maybe twice a year just to go through the recommendations, of which there are about 60 or 65, so quite a few. Um, but they're not going to, in and of themselves, they're not going to make themselves happen. People have to make them happen. Um, so I really strongly recommend uh, having just a small core group of four or five people who, let's say, twice a year get together, look through and say, OK, these are some that we need to talk about. Um, one thing that the Planning Commission did, which I think was a great idea, is not only did they have a task, an implementation task, but they recommended who would be driving that discussion and how long it should take, what the time period is. So some say one to three years, some say five years. So you have a sense of what the priorities are and who should really be leading that. So my strong recommendation, if you feel strongly about these coming to fruition, which I really hope you do, is that you, have, you assign a small group of people to help drive that process. And they're not going to do the work themselves, but they may say, OK, so you need to talk to someone at uh, this group and we need to get together and make implementation task number seven move forward. Because otherwise, I don't, honestly, I don't think many of them will move forward at all. Right. So that's my recommendation. I thought that the piece that was put together was very strong. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Chris, can I just make one Absolutely. Sure. Um, we did add some language, and I'm pretty sure we shared this with um, Duncan and Lee. Uh, and I'll just read it real quickly, if you don't mind. Um, but you may have some more. You may want to. Um, a little different too. It says, it is agreed that a working group is needed to implement the energy plan that will be representative of various entities in the community, including the town of Waterbury, Waterbury Leap, energy related businesses, building contractors, transportation providers, and private citizens. So we added that language in the um, introductory paragraph to the goals and objectives. Now, I realize that's very general. No, but um, just wanted to mention that. Thank you. So Duncan, seeing how you seem to be so heavily involved in this field, um, I have asked a, had asked a question in the past. Um, one of the questions I asked was if this uh, 2050 strategy, does that in also include, um, I mean, 90, was it 90, 90, 50, 2050? 90% renewable by 2050. Yeah. Okay. So, does that include the current use 
energy uses of today, or does, are they anticipating uh, progressive, progressing uses up to that time period? So I, In, I don't know the exact details. I believe <laughs> this is probably set at a level some years in the past. Sorry. I can't pick you up. Yep. So you should verify this. this is not my expertise, but I believe that this is the goals were set at some period a couple of years ago, and that they are looking to reduce by 90% by 2050 based on those levels. And it's across a variety of energy areas. Um, but if the, the state plan's online. You can you can read specifics uh, for that. Right. So not my expertise. Yeah, well, that's the question that I've been looking to have answered. And yeah. I, if you like, I can take a look and send you a link to to where that is. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, it's, yeah, I appreciate it. Sure. Anybody else like to talk about anything I'll, pertaining oh. to the municipal plan? I'm uh, Tracy Sweeney. I was just voted on to the Waterbury. Speak into the mic, please. Waterbury Conservation Commission last meeting, mm -hmm. and I just want to welcome you to meet with us if you'd like to know more about the Schutzville corridor and the impact it has on wildlife. Because you seem to have a lot of questions, which I can't answer because I'm new, <laughs> but the biologists on the commission can certainly answer those questions. Thank you. So, and thank you for folks putting forward the importance of the of the quarter. I, I have some questions sure. um, specific to the section on demand and affordability, um, which is on page 38 of the of the plan. Um, you know, the, the data, I looked up some of the data while I was sitting here, and I, my concerns are that the demand data that we're referring to might be significantly outdated um, just through conversation I have with realtors in the area and also you know employing about 50 people in this town I think we do have a supply issue that I don't think is represented well here and and my concern is is if this is an eight-year plan to move forward that maybe we're not addressing some of these demand needs as aggressively as we need to consider um, stated in the remaining part of the demand section is that there was some growth goals of additional units in Waterbury that most likely won't be met. Um, and then we get into the affordability part. Um, I haven't reread this, this new one, but I assume that it's a similar scenario where the only response to demand um, or for the affordability was to rely on third-party nonprofits, and I'm just concerned that we might need to get, and I know we are talking more about increasing density in areas like the downtown. Um, I just would like to know if we think that we need to reevaluate the demand section and if there's anywhere we can get more accurate data to represent where we are in 2018 and also um, how short-term housing, like Airbnb rentals, how they affect the data, because I know that I'm seeing it in Stowe and in Waterbury that I think that short-term rentals are really affecting the rental market for of, 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 uh, available units um, for people to live that can't afford to buy. Um, and so I'm just, I fear that we're running into an issue that people can't afford to live here, which I know I hear through conversation, and I'm just wondering what we can do to try to create more supply to avoid these demand issues. Did you want to say something? Yeah. 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 So um, first of all, this chapter was not rewritten. Um, we did an extensive rewrite in 2013. Uh, we worked closely with uh, the Regional Planning Commission. Um, the, the targets at that point in the regional plan were very aggressive. They were following the state guidance at the, at the time. And so we did add, add language to kind of explain that some of the uh, targets were probably unrealistic. But um, 
I think some of the, the principles continue. You know, um, certainly the nonprofit sector has been important in Waterbury, but I think the reality is that we're seeing a lot of private invest investment in housing, both um, in uh, multifamily and single family. I think we're, um, we're lucky that we have uh, the development that we have. Lots of, of Vermont municipalities would beg for the kind of development we have. So I think um, a lot of this, to me, is, out, is outside the control of the municipality. I think we support uh, projects through zoning. And with the rewrite, um, that is certainly one of the goals, is to try to provide opportunities, especially for multifamily housing and, and density in appropriate areas that can help in terms of the affordability side. Um, but I, I personally, I feel like the, um, the pace of development is uh, something that the factors, the economic factors that drive that are, are not something that the municipality really has that big a role in. And I think we provide opportunities through zoning. There's certainly, certainly with affordable housing, we we have uh, strongly supported the affordable housing uh, projects through the uh, loans from our revolving loan fund, facilitating, facilitating CDBG loans. And that, that certainly uh, creates or fulfills a certain niche. But I think um, the, the demand, um, I think the, um, the demand for worker housing, if you want to call it that, or people who are making $15 an hour or something, is a, is a huge issue that I think this has to be dealt with at a, at a fairly large level. And we can do the best we can, but I think um, creating opportunities, and I think the zoning rewrite is a good place for us to address some, some of those concerns. Right. So I don't know if that answers to, your question. To that I would add, if you look on page 46, which has the implementation actions for this section of the plan. Um, and if you go down the list, and if you see in number seven, it says explore the expansion and infill of the village growth centers, allowing higher density residential and mixed uses that include housing, which I think goes directly to Steve's comment about the zoning rewrite. So this is the town plan, update of the town plan. It's not an update of the town's regulations, which is a whole separate project. The second thing is if you go down to item number nine, um, it also calls for the creation of uh, forming a housing task force with local regional partners, including those identified in action seven, which I just referenced. So that's certainly something that would be within the purview of the select board um, if you wanted to create su such a task force. And that may be an appropriate, appropriate action. You know the. The economy is very strong right now. Unemployment is low. Um, uh, housing supply uh, is, has been a long-term problem, I think, in Vermont, and certainly in the places that have the strongest local economies. It's certainly been a major issue in Chittenden County, um, but here as well. So, um, so there are some action items that are in the plan. Again, echoing what Steve said about this was not a, a focus of what we were working sure. on, given that we had a limited time horizon. Yeah, I, I would say if this housing task force request has been in since at least 2013, we, we as a select board take this pretty seriously and look at putting putting this together and making it a priority. Well, when I read through this municipal plan, I made several notes, probably too many to uh, touch on tonight. Um, <laughs> As part of this uh, housing chapter, um, I made <laughs> probably more notes in that one particular chapter than than any. But um, uh, you know, on the goals on page uh, 45, where it says ensure the availability of safe, decent, and affordable housing for all current and future Waterbury residents. Number two, to create new housing in locations that maintain the integrity of neighbors while increasing density, respecting the natural environment, and minimizing the needs for infrastructure improvements. My note next to that was two goals almost impossible to meet. Um, there was a thing on the news here just a little bit ago. Um, Chittenden County, uh, their goal in the next five years, I believe, is to, to produce uh, 36 new units, 3,600 
new housing units, and a portion of those were supposed to have been affordable. And for whatever reason, and we, you know, we could have a long conversation over that, and I believe it's the way the, our system, government system is structured, and the way the rules and regulations in this state, and the hardships that are caused by living in a state that has, you know, huge fluctuating temperatures, and just a lot of different things that uh, all come together to make it impossible to uh, produce uh, affordable housing, they're not even going to be able to meet the small goal that they're trying to meet with affordable housing. So it's not like we're, we're sitting alone on this problem. Um, the other thing that I was wondering if we could get some statistics on that concerned me was um, how the tax rate, uh, I don't know how to say this, how the tax rate increases over a five-year period, a 10-year period, property tax rates increase based on a specific, you know, priced home uh, with incomes that relate to the affordability of those types of priced homes. Because what I was looking for was some kind of proof or at least uh, information that um, could show why housing is becoming out of reach for certain people in specific income brackets. You know what I'm saying, uh, if that makes any sense? Because I think moving forward in this state, we've seen an increase in our tax rates and, and just cost of living here that is becoming more and more uh, unaffordable to a lot of people. And uh, you know, this municipal plan does a lot of uh, commenting on the good side, but it doesn't show any statistics that uh, kind of open the door and expose some of the difficult reasons why, you know, people are having a tough time finding uh, affordable housing and, and other things. And I didn't know if there was any ability to have some of that type of information uh, also put in here. Well, Chris, some, sometimes what a uh, municipality has done is partner with groups like uh, Downstreet Community Development, which is formerly Central Mount Community Land Trust, and they do marketing studies and whatnot, uh, especially to uh, look at affordable housing. So sometimes those kind of in-depth snapshot studies that look at some of these different issues um, can be done as a special project, and sometimes in conjunction with an organization like that that has resources and um, the, the municipal plan is really um, more of a long-range plan, so you know, we're really trying to look at some more uh, long-term trends. Certainly, um, taxes are one factor in, in affordability. There's absolutely no question about that. There, there are a lot of other market forces that, and values that are other uh, that are, are factors as well. But I think the idea of having a task force to engage organizations like Downstreet and the private sector uh, is, is important. <coughs> the rest you guys simply do. supply and demand? <laughs> well, I don't think anything simple about the housing work. Yeah. seen, but uh, it, certainly that's a factor, yeah. Well, well, one of the things that I would also add is that when you talk to the housing developers, what they will tell you is, and I'm talking about some of the larger housing developments, uh, developers, um, the things that they talk about that are difficult for them to navigate, one has to do with the cost of land. So if the supply of land is constrained, it's going to drive up the price. And um, you know we have certain constraints here in Waterbury. You know, for example, um, we have limited areas where there's municipal sewer service available. That's going to limit your density. Just just the fact fact of life. Um, there are all kinds of other constraints. So the amount of land is is limited. That that is constrained. Um, and the other is has to do with the cost of infrastructure. Um, and that can also be related to availability of municipal water services. But even if you have them available, they're not cheap. Um, and then third, the other major factor that I hear outside of, say, the cost of materials um, is any sort of 
uncertainty, especially regarding the regulatory climate and the costs associated with that. So the cost that somebody might pay to get a permit in Waterbury probably going to be fairly modest in terms of its impact on the overall cost of a project. But if you have to go to Act 250, um, the cost of just submitting the application is very, very steep. So, you know, when you're talking about developments of a certain girth or scale, um, those become much more difficult. But those are the things that, that, in my experience, that I've heard the housing developers identify as being, um, make it very difficult for them to bring in housing product at we, what we would consider to be a, an, affordable, an affordable range. See, we have Ms. Forger here tonight. Um, do you have any uh, information you could shed some light on this particular topic? Uh, what on affordable you, housing? About housing in general, yes, and the well, shortage I of it. And could you could you step up to the mic for us, please? Appreciate it if you would. I didn't mean to put you on the spot there, but uh, <laughs> but he did. Um, I just feel all around the country, not only in Vermont, there's just a shortage of housing that's right across the board. And so I don't think we're particular to this area. Uh, as far as affordable housing, I think much of it is also tied into the cost of, of uh, materials. They have gone up despite, despite everything, they've gone up more. I don't know about how much labor has gone up. You would know that, Chris. But I know to build a, a nice house, I think you're probably talking about $200 a square foot, $225 a square foot. And that's probably not counting land. Maybe you can build something for one seventy-five. Perhaps you can shed light on that, Chris. I, I don't know. What, what do you think? You build it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, from the um, uh, labor's perspective, um, you know, I know that myself and others have, are trying to hold the line on, on costs because of that reason. I mean, it, there's only so much uh, the public can absorb when it comes to, you know, spending money on a, on a home. And uh, if, you, if, if you allow not only your prices but everything around you to get too high, then your business suffers. Uh, well, in Waterbury, I think anything under 400,000 generally is very active. Right. I think there's a real market for that. Uh, above that, there's still some market of below 500, not too much. 600, there's resistance. But it's going up here, too. I mean, you're seeing that. Well, you have to just look at Paul Arnott's development and see what is happening there. I mean, I, one of the houses he built is, has come in at $550,000, and, and that land was very inexpensive that he bought. Yeah. And uh, maybe 16, 1,700 square feet. That's quite a bit. I think the, probably the price range, I mean, I know that there's people out there that are struggling to even afford anything in the two, two to three range, you know, and three is really pushing it. And I think what probably what Mark uh, Fryer's concerns are about are in that, in that lower range and, and uh, but what Chris, there's also existing houses that I've seen on uh, Howard Avenue for one. The house has been sitting there, some of them for just months and months and no one's touching them and they're very affordable. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, there's two sides to a coin. I think there is, is houses that need mm -hmm. doing, but at least it's a house where you can start there. Yeah. That's it. Thanks, Judy. Um, Go ahead, Mark. From what I'm hearing here, it, it sounds like the, there, there's no real substantive comments uh, concerning the plan. However, it appears as though there are a couple of action items for consideration by the select board, and those relate to uh, working groups, the working group on the energy issue and also the housing task force uh, recommendation that is listed in the existing plan. So from uh, my perspective anyway, those are the two takeaways that I've gotten from this discussion thus far, but as far as commentary related to the plan itself, um, uh, I, I think given the lack of any substantive uh, commentary to the contrary, um, looks in good shape from my perspective. Yeah. Other board members? I would agree. Um, 
I guess the third thing, I thought it was interesting, um, thank you for the Conservation Commission member to coming, stepping up. Maybe um, this forest fragmentation issue, at some point we could invite uh, maybe a couple people from the Conservation Commission to come and talk to us, kind of what the status of the Shoesville Hill uh, area is, and because I know there's some issues going on to try to conserve land up there, and just talk about this topic think would be uh, illuminating. Well, I'll make it real quick here, because I know we got to kind of close this out and move on. But uh, the other day when I was reading the force fragmentation chapter, it just happened to be a program on DEV where uh, Dave Graham had a couple professionals yes. or experts in on specifically that. Uh, and I called in and talked a little bit about it, and uh, it was a quite interesting program. And I said to myself, it's too bad we couldn't get those type of people in here to talk about stuff like that, Maybe but yeah. <laughs> yeah. So if there's- I have one quick comment okay, Mark. before we close out. Um, back to the, the question on regulation when it comes to development. Um, is there a section in here talking about reviewing and potentially moving towards um, a 10 acre town for Act 250 instead of a one acre town, like similar towns our size have, have gone to? Don't think we we uh, you know address that um, the the history of um, the town beefing up its subdivision regulations has been a checkered one uh, at at best and so certainly at the planning commission level we've been a little reticent to reopen that Pandora's box because of past efforts in the past where planning commissions, and this, a lot of this goes back to before my time, have spent a lot of time and energy trying to craft proposals that then just got shot down here at the select board level. And so um, my own position on it, and this is just my own personal position, not necessarily the position of the planning commission, is that um, Given the amount of time and resources we have and the amount of things that are on our plate, um, I would be loath to encourage the Planning Commission to dive into this unless we get some sort of direction from the select board, from you folks, that you are open to that prospect. Because otherwise, it's quite frankly, it's just not a good use of our time. And the last time it happened with the Planning Commission, um, there were a lot of sore feelings that resulted from it. So, you know, we're all just citizen volunteers. You know, we show up on our free time, we roll up our sleeves twice a month, we try to do the best we can. But at the end of the day, we want to spend our time, our resources wisely. And um, again, my own position is I wouldn't encourage us to spend six to eight months to go into an elaborate process that had a snowball's chance in you know where of making it to March. So. Understood. Yeah. Maybe I could just add um, one thing that we could do in conjunction with the zoning rewrite is to, um, to have a joint meeting at some point just to focus on this issue. Um, you know, I know there's been um, there's been pressure from the private sector in Waterbury to address this. I think we should address it. Um, I I agree. I think it need there needs to be consensus on how we would move forward. I don't think the municipal plan is necessarily the right place to highlight that issue, but I think the zoning rewrite is the right place um, because I think that's where the um, you know that we would need to resolve this. Uh, ultimately, it's up to the select board on how you want to move forward with all this, by the way, because if there's an ordinance, but uh, I, yeah. I, I, was, I, I was going to ask, aren't we <clears throat> kind of prescribed by an ordinance to be uh, subject to Act 250 right. right now? Because we do have subdivision regulations. Right. And I think that the Planning Commission has done what was necessary to get us probably 90% through that door. Mm -hmm. And it would be more of an act of the select board as opposed to the planning commission at this stage to get the rest of the 10% of the way through. I, mean, I haven't looked at the subdivision regs for a long time, but I, I think they would be 
adequate, probably, to do what uh, Act 250 requires, right? Yeah, the, the rewrite has a lot of good information, uh, additional um, criteria, both in subdivision and I think uh, we could look at site plan review as well, because that's the other area we could address. So I think a separate meeting to address this issue is a really good one. And then I think ultimately, as Bill said, it's up to the select board how you want to move forward and, with that. And it's not just been the select board. I mean, there have there are private citizens in the community who wave the flag to say, let's keep Act 250 to protect us from ourselves. Because if we were doing it ourselves, they, they wouldn't be happy necessarily. So it's not just the select boards of the past. There have been members of the public who have said, we don't want to be in Act 250. We don't want to leave Act 250. I, if I could add to that, one of the um, most input we've had so far in our zoning rewrite, which we put aside to get to the municipal plan and then we'll go back to, has been around increasing what the regulations might change to increase density in the village areas and changing various zoning requirements site plan review and land use that might allow for more dense housing. So that has been the biggest pushback we've gotten so far. Right. Even though that's the direction we, we've been moving, that's where the voices come out and tell us, no, you're not doing that. Yeah, and I think, I think there's a lot. Mark hit on one thing that I heard about just today, and, and Ken has made some points. But when you look at the map, and you look at the 40% of the land area that's all in state land, so you're constrained right there. If you compare Waterbury to, say, Barrytown, you know, Barrytown has been able to, to do a lot of housing outside the Ring of Barry, and some of it, you know, they've developed water systems and, and uh, wastewater systems and the like. And, and we're kind of constrained both in terms of the ability to to build on a lot of the land that we have in town. And then we have the very constrained village district, you know, hard by the river and the interstate and, you know, the hillside going up the hill. Uh, so it's really, you know, the density issue is the key to additional housing. You can build housing out, up where I live, but as Judy has just alluded to, you know, when, when people have to buy, spend a lot of money to buy a piece of land, they're not going to build, you know, a house that sits on Weasel Mountain up on a, a five-acre plot up in Waterbury Center. They're just, they're not going to do that. They're they smart, they would, but <laughs> well, <laughs> from the tax perspective. <laughs> from the tax perspective, but from the idea of getting your money back for right. the land, you're not going to build, a, you know, a three-bedroom, 780-square-foot <laughs> house or something like that. And, and but we, uh, the other thing that Mark said today, and I just had a guy in my office today who was asking about 51 South Main Street, um, and I, I told him that it's really probably not available until after the Main Street project right now, given what the commissioners have decided they're going to do. But he was interested in buying that property so he could develop what an Airbnb on it. He said, oh, I've got four or five Airbnbs in downtown locations. He's got a couple in rural locations. But he said, you know, Winooski, Colchester, places that are, you know, people, they come in. That's what um, uh, the fellow who did the Chris, was Chris, Parsons. Chris, Parsons. Chris Parsons was talking about, right. you know, uh, temporary housing for uh, transients. And, uh, I think that really is something that we need to consider because he said, I can get four times as much money uh, on my rentals from Airbnb than I can get in the standard housing market. And if you just allow it, <laughs> yeah, I know. Forget That's affordable housing. Cities like Austin, Texas have put in rules surrounding new construction that it's limited in the amount of short term rental housing it can be used for to help thwart that. Because I think Stowe's seen it in a big way. Yeah. Waterbury, I think, has seen it. Even I have friends who have a one bedroom unit. They're off you know, in the hills, but now they have a way to rent it, making way more money than they would if they just rented it out. So years ago, that would have been rented as an apartment. Now it's not. And you take that unit away, and however many other units you look on any of those short term sites, and they're all over, they're all over the place. Yeah. 
So from a timeline perspective, should, should I just mention, um, the Planning Commission is meeting next week, and I think you've uh, given some good to-dos. I've noted down um, some of the comments that I think should be addressed. Um, would you like the Planning Commission to come back with some language to address those issues for your next meeting? Uh, we have a timeline where, uh, in order to get this plan through, we'll need to have you warn a hearing at your next meeting for the first meeting in December. So um, that that's what we had anticipated in the timeline. Uh, if, if you'd like the Planning Commission to address some of these uh, concerns that have been raised uh, with some suggested language, I could work with them at the meeting next week, and then we could bring that back to you for a, a final draft, hopefully, that warrant well, for December 3rd. Um, just to throw out another option, and I do appreciate how much time the Planning Commission has already spent, and if at the next Select Board meeting you have to warn a hearing for sometime in December, it really seems unlikely that the Planning Commission can really do a lot of work now before you need to adopt this. You've done a lot of work here. As Mark said, there haven't been any substantive comments except for these things regarding the two task force for energy and housing. There are issues clearly that need to be addressed, but they don't have to be in the plan that we adopt after the hearing in December. And if it's really, you know, rises to the level of importance, just because the town plan won't expire for eight years, it doesn't mean you can't revisit it before That's that correct. period of time. So I would just say, you know, respect the work that the Planning Commission has done. I think it's a pretty good document and move forward for now towards adoption. And then we can talk about these things in a reasonable time frame. And then if you want to ask the Planning Commission to address a section, they, they can go back and readdress it, and you can readopt it after that. There's no crime in doing it. But so, would you still have to go through the public hearing process yeah, and all any, that as well? Any time that, you, anytime that you're going to amend or readopt the plan, you have to go through the same process. It's just that, you know, it's October 15th now. This has to be adopted. December 3rd, I think. By it's December 3rd, and to ask that for, for real, you know, heavy lifting between now and December, I, I think is a little unrealistic. And, and if we set up these task force maybe early next year and get them going a little bit, then you can work with the planning commission. And if, if, if you have to, you can readdress, reopen the plan. Certainly for housing, because the statistics are based on census data, primarily, that are in the housing. Right. So if there's a housing task force that the select board forms that can give us input that could be addressed, you know, that we can look at <laughs> along with the 2020 census data, I think that's a good time frame for sure. working on the housing issues. And our zoning regs that might help get us with your support, <laughs> get us closer to some of those density issues. And zoning for yeah, I think the reason, the reason I brought it up, stuff. Bill, is I, I think if the select board wants to make any substantive changes related to any of these issues, now is the time to do it before we warn a final draft. Once you, you're hearing in early December, um, you can't make any substantive changes in order to adopt that draft. Um, it's like zoning, once you do your final public hearing, that draft, other than maybe fixing a punctuation error or something. So that's why I, I want, I guess, to find out more than anything, do you want the Planning Commission to, I mean, I'm not, it's not a heavy lift or big changes, but do you want them to tweak any of the language that's in there now, or do you feel it's adequate the way it's written? Well, like I said, I've made a lot of notes, but uh, it's, <laughs> You know, they were just, some of them were comments, some of them's, uh, like uh, when it came to deer yarding and uh, wildlife habitat, one thing or another, um, I would have liked to have seen something in there that pertained to uh, people and controlling their animals, their dogs, um, because that's a huge issue when it comes to, you know, the impact to wildlife, and there's nothing in there that even speaks to any form of uh, dog control um, and I know we have an ordinance and all that, but um, it's 
I don't know. It's just one of those things that have been nice to see a little bit of information or comments about, you know, the fact that those are, are huge impacts on wildlife as well as the other things that were. But it's not, uh, I'm not saying that it's uh, a do or die uh, request. I mean, I think Bill's right. Um, you know, if, we, if there's changes that we want to see in future date, um, we can certainly talk about it. But uh, overall, I'm happy with the, the municipal plan as a whole, and I think you guys have done a great job. Um, and I, you know, like Bill said, I appreciate your time and efforts. Um, so. The task force are in there, so yeah, yeah. We, we can flesh out details. So we'll flesh out details. Those uh, issues later. If everybody's happy and there's no further comments, we can officially close out this hearing and. Uh, can I just say? Okay. Not to mess things up, but we'll you have to speak for my So, Tracy Sweeney again. Um, now, my other job, my real job, is I, I work with the homeless. So, I would encourage that when you're looking at, at housing, that you bring in Down Street and other providers that can give you a personal side. I'm hearing a lot about money, but I'm not hearing about what it's like to be on the fringes or how the restaurants aren't able to um, have their staff. They can't find staff because they can't house here. So just to keep that in mind when you're doing the task force, that you have that side of it, too. Thank you, Tracy. Okay. So I guess we will then. If it's all right with you, Ken, uh, we'll officially close out the hearing. It works for me. Okay. Uh, it works for me. Yep. Okay. So we'll also close adjourn this meeting of the Waterbury Planning Commission and let you get on with the rest of your work. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. You. Thank you again. Much. Appreciate it. Well, since we have a quorum, I actually have to go to work. Yeah, you, know, you, you told me you were going to have to bug out, so. I'll make a motion that we approve the agenda as presented. Okay. Um, I want to call the hearing or call the meeting to order first. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, so there's been a motion made to approve the agenda. Jane, would you I'll like second to second that? that? Okay. So one item to one. add, um, a request for closing Randall Street for Halloween. All right. So we'll put, put that right. Manager's items. All right. Want. Yep. Okay, so there's been a motion made and seconded, and with the change of um, talking about closing Randall Street for Halloween, um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Consent agenda items. Uh, all we have is the minutes for October 1st meeting. Um, <coughs> there a motion to approve the uh, consent I'll make, agenda? I'll make a motion to approve the minutes of the October 1st meeting. Okay. I'll second that. Yep. Uh, no further comments. Uh, all those in favor of approving that, say aye. 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 All right. Public, is there anybody here wish to speak? Go ahead, Everett. I will be very brief. Uh, at the Edward Farrar meeting last week, uh, I presented Karen with two squash and a pepper. They came out from the kids' gardens at the community gardens on Main, on Winooski Street. And I understand and feel sorry that Deb was in a very difficult time with her health issues. I talked with Nick, and there were some other vegetables out there, but if you're gonna do that next year under the Recreation Committee, uh, we need somebody to lead it so that those plants like a little drink of water more often. I rototilled it before they started. I rototilled it a couple times after that. When they planted their basil and their various plants that got free from Evergreen Gardens, they didn't bother to put any sticks on them, and it's a little hard to, to, to uh, rototill like that. Uh, so uh, my recommendation is it's a good thing because 
There are people in our community and other communities in Vermont that wouldn't know how to raise a carrot if they were going to die if they didn't have one. <laughs> uh, so that's the garden situation. In behalf of the people on Winooski Street, the people who walk, run, and use strollers, uh, finally we're getting some new sidewalks, which is a good thing. Uh, on the uh, Edward Farrar meetings, prior to becoming water sewer commissioners, they were water commissioners, the trustees were the sewer commissioners. And it's seen because when you start a project for water, oftentimes you run into a, a sewer project, so the trustees moved to have the former water commissioners become water sewer commissioners, and now we have people in the town using the, utilizing the water supply, and some, if they were uh, pushed over into a village portion, formerly village portion, they're in the Farrar district now. And I think it would be very good to have Ann, if she's willing, and the cost is not way out of line, have the meetings of the Edward Farrar Utility District recorded as you have yours tonight. And I would strongly ask that you, as select board members, encourage those other five commissioners to do so. And the other final thing, which is not to do with me, it's to do with who you vote for. I believe on Thursday night, Carla, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the six uh, candidates for Senate for Washington County are supposed to be in this room Thursday night, the 18th, for a debate. And uh, looking ahead, uh, we certainly have some things in state government that some of the senators will help control or have control over. And we need to get people out and learn what people are really standing for and what they want in Vermont in terms of affordability. Any questions? No, but I wasn't aware of that uh, debate here. Thank you. Appreciate it. Am I, am I correct on that, Carla? Aren't you aware? Right? Well, it's, it's been on. It's been on uh, either front porch forum or somewhere. I didn't dream it. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Okay. I think, uh, the, I think the League of Women Voters is sponsoring it. Oh. Okay. Okay, Bill. It's your turn. Okay. Um, so Steve is here. He's going to give us a report on the um, proposed nomination for the expansion of the National Register of Historic Places. Um, this is a historic district that's in the former village, um, and because the Edward Ferrar Utility District now has only authority for water and sewer and a few other specifically um, itemized things uh, in the language that created it. Uh, the, the nomination that the process the trustees started over a year ago uh, to expand the historic district is now fallen into the select boards uh, anyway. So Steve's here to tell you about this. Um, just briefly, we did mention this, I think, a couple weeks ago when the presentation was made here, but the, the trustees originally decided to seek expansion of the historic district to allow uh, property owners, homeowners in particular, a little bit more flexibility with regard to the flood regulations if properties are substantially damaged. If they're in a historic district, um, they don't have to uh, elevate to the degree that they would have to if they weren't. So that was the impetus of the trustees. So I'll turn it over to Steve. Okay. So I passed a letter that uh, came to you, Chris, um, from the state. And this is a notification that um, there's a proposed nomination to the National Register of Historic Places for um, an expanded uh, Waterbury Village Historic District. And um, so Bill mentioned the areas. I'll just go over this briefly. I know you've already had a presentation by Scott, but um, this is going to the State Historic Preservation Commission on November 15th. We don't have a time yet, but uh, the nomination materials are available on the um, Division for Historic Preservation website, including this map. And uh, this shows the entire proposed district, including the existing historic district, which uh, <laughs> focuses primarily on nor North and South Main Street, down uh, just past Batchelder Street. Also includes Randall Street, the state complex, and uh, Thatcherbrook Primary School, and houses up along Stowe Street. 
So um, the, the areas that Bill referred to are South Main Street from uh, just about, uh, just beyond the Hunger Mountain Children's Center and the um, south entrance into the state complex and Batchelder Street all the way down to uh, the Maplewood Convenience Store and including that building. And then the other area uh, that's also in the 100-year floodplain is the lower end of Union Street. So when you get down below the uh, former Squire House, uh, those properties are all within the 100-year floodplain. And so that is proposed as an addition to the historic district as well. And when this um, was reviewed by the state, by Devin Coleman, who's the um, state uh, historic preservation uh, specialist, um, he uh, asked that the area of High Street, Hill Street, and Railroad Street be added as well to the district because uh, there are uh, numerous historic houses in that area, and it's in between the existing district and the uh, Thatcherburg Primary School. So that area was also surveyed. I think there are about um, almost a um, well, I probably shouldn't say. It's well over 100 uh, buildings that are in these new areas. Um, on the map, the, um, the white <laughs> outlined buildings are contributing structures. So um, it, when a structure is contributing, it means that it has an historic designation in the district. And then the black ones are non-contributing structures, typically uh, less than 50 years old or uh, historic buildings that have been uh, uh, very uh, seriously modified, if you will. The, there are also some um, interior courts, like um, the Adams Court, um, the Parker Court, where Anne lives, um, Locust Terrace, I believe. There, there are some interior areas. Well, that, that's part of this block. but. There are some interior courts, uh, parts of Moody Court, that were not included in the original nomination. So those areas have all been added. So uh, all the buildings within this outline are uh, part of the nomination. Bill mentioned the benefit to houses that are uh, designated as contributing historic structures uh, within the 100-year floodplain. Um, if they're substantially improved, the building is not required to be elevated. Uh, utilities do need to be elevated, but not the building <coughs> itself. So I just wanted to uh, really be brief at this point, uh, answer any questions you have, and let you know that the process is moving forward. And, and just to be clear, there's, <laughs> except for the, the nomination that's been done, there's there's no obligation on the municipality's part to do anything. There, you know, we, we have flood regulations that talk about what happens in the flood. We specifically ex exempt these structures. But in terms of maintaining this district, um, if this passes, there's not going to be any financial burden placed on the town to accept uh, what the trustees have asked for, correct? Right, that, that's correct. Um, there, there are um, really uh, no restrictions that come with designation. Uh, if the municipality decides to, let's say, extend our design review district to uh, take in some of these areas, that's, that's up to the municipality to, to take that step. And there are benefits uh, for income producing buildings, uh, that for tax credits, federal and state tax credits. So it doesn't obligate the town really to do anything at this point. Uh, it's, it's really quite beneficial. All of the property owners in the uh, expanded area were notified by the state by letter. Uh, we worked very closely with them to make sure they had all the proper mailing addresses for all of those people. and. Um, they, so they were um, notified. They can come to the hearing. Um, interestingly enough, and this is an outline in this letter, more than half of the people in that expanded area would have to object in order for the commission to be required to uh, not to accept it. If you have an individually uh, nominated building, let's say like the seminary building or some of the other buildings that are very prominent and nominated, then if the landowner objects, 
the commission will not move forward with the nomination. But in a case like this where it's a district, uh, people may object or may have questions, but that doesn't, just, that doesn't obligate the commission to withhold that property from the district or something of that nature. I think we've only had one call from uh, the people who received the letters to date. Uh, there may be other questions that come up. So there's no impact uh, from a cost perspective to right. any of these additions to the to the district uh, pertaining to the, directly to the owners, right? Right. Right. That's correct. And in fact, if there were flood damage or something, they would, and they were in this district. It allows more people to take advantage of the flexibility offered to not have to elevate their building. Right. So that would be a potential cost savings to someone they have who's, substantial if damage. they're substantially improving a building. Right. And we, we also found out when we considered elevating properties on Randall Street that, you know, um, there, the flip side could be the case as well, that you get pushback from the historic folks about trying to, you know, elevate something that's that's historic because then it becomes out of character with the rest of the neighborhood. But I, I think the flexibility for the property owner not to be required to do that is much more helpful. And we did, I, I, I did ask Steve specifically because I did feel the, the one call that we received. <clears throat> um, you know, if somebody, say up on High Street now, uh, if this district was approved, if they decided that they wanted to put replacement windows in or put a new roof on their house or, or even tear the building down, they would not be prohibited from doing that because of this designation. All of the regulations with regard to that would only come from the local community. So if you're in the design review district, which is on Main Street and some right. other areas there, you know, those people, if you're in the design review district, you have to get permits and, and the like to do certain things. But it's not because they're in the state's designated historic district that they have to have that. So uh, just a quick question, um, talking about historic, the barn that Lefty Saya had? Right. Was that a, was that a big loss as, for, as part of being part of the historic nature or the you know what I mean the buildings down in this area was that uh, how significant I guess was that building well it, uh, it was an accessory structure and those are shown in the nomination and, and described so uh, I mean I I can't tell you I know it was damaged in the flood of 1927 and and really never quite recuperated but uh, <laughs> to put it mildly but I, yeah I, I don't know that I'm really the one to speak to that, I mean, uh, our goal certainly in the municipal plan is to try to encourage people to retain and maintain historic structures. But, right. Um, and the, the tax credits typically go to income producing right. properties, right? So that's, that's yes. a residential property, it's just a residential barn. So I think it's an aesthetic loss and it is a yeah. historic loss to the community that that once, I'm sure, a beautiful barn right. has now fallen in. but. No more so than the beautiful Fire Not Newton 100 that was there once before. <laughs> it's no longer either, you know? Yeah. Yes. Any other questions from the board? No. Nope. Okay, good. We'll keep you posted. All right, yeah, appreciate Thanks, it. Thanks, Steve. You're welcome. Thanks. Super's report. Huh? So at your, at your place is uh, the report for September from the state. Um, I typically send this out to Mark. I'm not sure if he had a chance to look at anything, but I'll turn it over to him. Sure. Um, I will consolidate this into a graphical image uh, as we did before. And, and actually what I want to do uh, as well is put the uh, whole quarter together so that we'll have a a look at the quarter's worth of activity. Um, the, uh, the question I guess I would have is regarding placement on uh, the website. When we first put it up, we just stuck it in as a news item. I guess the question I would have is, is there a better cataloging of these for uh, easy reference by 
by the sure, public. We can work make with a the page. website person yeah. and yeah. develop something. Yeah, because uh, as they come in month to month and everything, pretty soon we're going to just have that whole mm -hmm. blocked up, and that makes good sense. Um, what uh, what we're seeing here is pretty consistent with what we saw last month, um, and and that is that the the bulk of uh, uh, the responses and activity are coming from the two troopers that are assigned here. Um, they uh, the uh, number of calls is relatively consistent. Um, uh, if you add the two of these together, that 112 here, the first month was 100, everything seems to run right around that, uh, that level of, uh, of calls for service. And uh, last month and this month, both uh, uh, the share handled by the two troopers here is significantly higher than what is coming out of Middlesex. The um, uh, troopers have been uh, actively involved in um, activities here in the community. Uh, they noted here the, uh, the bike walk to school piece. That was a relatively short notice uh, item, but they, they made sure that they had a, had a presence here in town for that. Um, we've made them aware of um, the uh, um, block party that went on previously and then uh, with the item coming up on Randall Street, uh, we'll just make them aware of that with um, uh, Halloween following in the mid part of the week, they'll, they'll have a presence around for that. Um, you can see that it's a uh, uh, pretty uh, varied uh, amount of responses and everything, but they're, they're active out there making traffic stops and uh, picking up um, arrests related to that activity. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm hearing uh, very good things about it. The, the presence, the visibility has been something that's been um, uh, noted as, uh, as a very positive um, item for the community. So um, I think to this point, um, it, it's been what we were, we were actually looking forward to with respect to entering into this. And, uh, I guess my only question for you is whether or not our bill has shown up yet. Yes, it has. I think it might be in this week's orders. Yes. Um, Good. And it was the right amount. <laughs> um, most of these are self-explanatory, but uh, what is directed patrol? Uh, that's when, um, based on uh, uh, complaints, concerns within the community, they'll focus on a particular area for uh, patrol purposes. Um, with the village PD, they, they used to do a fair amount of that with downtown uh, foot patrols and the like, but for, uh, for this, it's, it's really like taking a segment of the town and focusing on that for uh, patrolling purposes. As an example, I, I don't know if you would agree, but um, <clears throat> I had a call from a gentleman in the Harvey Farm, which is a private uh, highway, um, we, don't, we don't own it and we can't regulate it with regard to speed, so there's no town speed limits on that road. But the complaint was that delivery trucks, FedEx, UPS in particular, uh, were going quite fast in there. So, you know, I, I called Lieutenant White and spoke with him about that, and he said, that's a, you know, it's, it's in your town, <laughs> and uh, you know those folks pay taxes. We can we can send a, a trooper up there, and um, uh, so I imagine that's probably one of the eleven directed patrols. In mm -hmm. fact, I I saw them in there a couple weeks ago when I was going home. I could see a trooper coming out. Um, so that kind of thing probably, um, you know, the Union Street block party the other day if. If that had been in September, it might be there. The, the uh, walk and bicycle to school. Um, I believe they're going to help out on the River of Light Parade as well yep. in December. Those kind of things are directed to folks, I think. So agency assist, we had one. Is that uh, us assisting somebody else or somebody else coming in and assisting us? No, that was um, the troopers assisting another agency. I, I could have been related to any 
any number of things, but quite often that's like a, a police department or another governmental agency from outside of the town uh, looking to locate somebody or confirm right. some it, it could be It could be Wasi for the ambulance. It could be the fire department in Duxbury. Yeah. Uh, any, any kind of thing like that. Yeah. Good. Anne had her hand up at one point. Well, I was going to mention the rumor of white parade. Yeah. What I'm about that. Yeah. Yeah. No, they've uh, uh, they've committed to assisting us with that. Um, the uh, uh, public works folks are going to provide a tail on the parade, but there'll be a couple of troopers assigned to lead the parade and and manage some of the traffic work. No action necessary, Chris, unless you have questions. But. No, I, I was just going to, you know, seeing the traffic stops and the tickets and all that, um, you know, the, I know their presence has uh, made it an impact, but I can tell you it's there's still people out there that uh, got their foot right on the pedal. It's never a shortage of fish in the barrel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Jane, you all set? Also, thank okay. You. Move on to the next item. So the Better Back Roads grant application. Um, this is a small grant application uh, for Category A grant. Uh, this is uh, relating to the uh, municipal roads, the general permit that we, we're required to have now. Uh, we have to do a road inventory. Um, the state has identified. Um, Segments. I think there's 422 hydrologically connected segments of roadway in Waterbury. These are both gravel roads and paved roads. And going further down the line, in order to get <clears throat> any type of help to replace the grant, I mean the grant, to replace like the culvert Hubbard's. that we had on Hubbard Farm Road even, uh, you need to do this, uh, you need to comply with the general permit. Um, and the general permit came into effect in, in July of 18. So we're moving forward. Um, this grant application would be for $8,000 and it would allow us to use that money to contract with the Regional Planning Commission to do um, uh, an inventory of these uh, 442 road, road segments. Uh, segments are identified as uh, 100 meters in length, so that's about 330 feet. Um, we have 442 330 foot or less <laughs> segments that somehow are interconnected with with um, the waters of the state. So Winooski River, Thatcher Brook, uh, any of the small brooks up uh, in the center, wetlands and the like. Um, so anyway, I would ask that you authorize the submission of this grant. It has to be in by October 26th and authorize me to sign it. Uh, the work will more than likely be done in 2019. And as I said, it's really, if we expect to get any other grants for uh, structures, uh, you really need to start with this. I'll make a motion to authorize the application for the Better Back Roads grant or Category A. I'll second that. Okay. You authorize me to sign it. I authorize you to sign. All right. Any further discussion? All those approved say aye. 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 Thanks. So both. the work will involve um, inspections of gravel roads, um, of paved roads, and we even have to look at outfalls of storm drains. So, you know, in the paved, in the paved sections of our highways, when we have catch basins, we'll have to uh, inventory those discharge places as well. So, thank you. I do have a question. Has that kind of inventory work been done before? Um, not to the degree that they're going to do this. More detail. Um, we've, we've done inventories on uh, both culverts and on road surfaces. 
But this work um, is going to involve looking at uh, ditches and uh, you know the what you know if they're greater than a five percent slope, what is you know vegetated stone line check dams and the like. Um, looking at the crown of the road to make sure that you know it allows the water to shut off properly in the areas that it is looking at um, especially um, we don't have a lot of culverts that cross the roads that this that just discharge into a field we have some but most of them just carry a brook across but where we are discharging from a road into a field they want to see where that water goes and how it's distributed into the landscape. So some of it we've already done similar work, but it's a little bit more extensive and we're taking some things that we haven't looked at before. So nothing pertaining to uh, possible uh, retention pond structures or anything like that? Um, Retention pond okay, structures okay, that the, the construction well, if, of those. If we own them, then they would look at those. But we don't. We don't have I mean, as part of this new, the new regs, are they going to ask that the town possibly have to construct some of those um, structures? I think that's unlikely, Chris. I, I won't say absolutely not, but I don't think that's what they're getting into in a town like ours. In some of the communities that have been identified in um, watersheds that are impaired, you know, Chittenden County, they have a much higher bar that they have to deal with. But I, I, I doubt we'll get into that. Yeah, I went to uh, VLCT training with Woody on this. Uh, this topic was covered there, and it seemed as though it was a matter of uh, uh, producing the inventory and tying it to uh, future eligibility for funding to support right. projects. So if, if you don't have the inventory done, properly done, um, your eligibility is impacted. And if you do have the survey done and completed, then that's uh, uh, more of a pre-qualifier for you. And the uh, regional planning commissions really had all the software and the mapping stuff that was going to uh, make that possible. Yep. Yeah, it actually sounds like quite a good deal for $8,000. So. Yeah, I think it is. Our, it, it's about a $9,500 project. Our share will be about 1500 Most of that will be spent just in staff time. There probably won't be a, a big cash match. But anyway, related to that, um, in our uh, highway infrastructure capital improvement plan for 2018, one of the projects that we had was armoring of the stream bank, uh, Little River. There was some damage a year or so ago. Uh, we did get a grant for that. And the grant period is uh, July 1st, 18 through June 30th, 19. And we were planning to do that project this year. It's in our capital budget. Um, uh, two things happened. We were under a little bit of a uh, time crunch. But the, the state stream alteration engineer asked us to, to wait until 2019 to do this work. As awkward as it sounds, um, he didn't want the work to be done when the river was as low as it was. And it's, it's kind of odd, odd that they would say that on Little River because that is regulated more by the dam than anything yeah. except it's a run of the river operation now. It's not, you know, they don't, um, they don't get to store water and then release the big flow Once at peak times right. like they did before. And obviously with as dry as the summer was um, for the water coming in from all the brooks, uh, they weren't discharging as much. So uh, the, the email said that the unusually dry weather this season uh, while might be ideal conditions to actually work in the stream, it is not um, 
preferential at this time, the stream engineer prefers to have more flow creating less impact on aquatic life. So we're not going to get that job done this year. Because you're right, I would have expected just the opposite, you know, like you said. Yeah. Well, because they always, they've always asked us to try to do these projects in uh, August. Mm. In the, you know, it's the low flow month usually. And uh, that's what we did on the Hubbard Farm Road was to, you know, get that when that stream was as low as possible. But anyway, um, it's still on the books. It just won't happen this year. I mean, when we did the project up by the school there, down over the bank, um, reconstructing that big stone retaining wall there, we actually had to, I don't know if you remember, we put big culverts in the yeah. water and diverted, right. diverted the water around the work areas just to <laughs> prevent uh, damage. Uh, yeah. Okay, uh, up street, up, update on the Main Street project. Yeah, the update on the Main Street project is, is that uh, last week it was put out to bid by VTrans. Um, I believe it's going to be the second week in December that the bids will be opened. Um, and right now the, it's in a range, uh, the, the estimate is in the 20 to 30 million dollar range, and because we were talking 25 before, uh, Ken Upmall is suggesting that it's probably going to push 30. Um, I've been trying to push Ken for a while to help get some uh, estimates for what it's going to cost us. As you remember, it's a 2% uh, local match for eligible items. Uh, there are well, probably not for the town. Most of the items for the town that I'm aware of are, are eligible. There may be a few ineligible costs for the uh, utility district that they'll have to pay 100% of. But um, what I'm hoping for is that uh, the bids will come in, that there'll be a clear winner, that it's within their budget, and then they can do some bid tabs. <coughs> And then we'll be able to use that to determine what our costs are going to be in 2019 and 2020. The completion date is advertised as June 30th, 2021. Uh, that would be two full construction seasons, late April, early May of 18 through the fall of 19 would be the bulk of the construction would be done. And then um, in the spring, early summer of 2019, it would be uh, any cleanup, some of the landscaping and some of the signage, the wayfinding signs and things like that. So spring of 2020. 2021. 21. Yeah, basically, basically 18s, cleanup. 19s, and 20s Nin got kind of 19, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, we know. <laughs> right, anyway. I believe it's 21, but you might, I'll have to check with Barb tomorrow. So. Yeah, the June 2021 has a familiar sound to it. Yeah, that's <laughs> correct. Yeah, um, it's a two-year project. Yeah, so 1920 would be the construction season, yeah. I'm sorry, and then 21 would be the wayfinding signage yeah. and the landscape. Yeah. Details. Yeah. So anyway, I'm hopeful that in December we'll know what the total project cost is, and then I'll work with the state to segregate out the highway, uh, sidewalk, storm drainage costs, signage costs from the water costs and the sewer costs. And obviously, there's three different municipal budgets, two EFUD budgets and one highway budget. So the, the cost to the town, even if $30 million is the top number, it won't be 2% of $30 million to the town. It will be 2% of $30 million minus whatever the water, minus whatever the sewer is. So, mm -hmm. um, and then we'll, so I'm hopeful we'll have good information when we get to budget time in January. Okay, that's it. Uh, yeah, well, close. Uh, but just one little comment there on the Main Street project. Um, it seems as though that us, the town, are uh, 
making a practice now of putting foam under our sidewalks. I know that uh, during conversation there with Ken Upmall at one point um, that had been discussed and I think it was uh, Sipple that brought it up to him. Um, and he really was kind of unaware of the concept and uh, but was interested in it. And I didn't know if, uh, if for whatever reason you might happen to bump into him or would he have a conversation with him and, and maybe bring up the possibility it may and it may be way too late in the game but he showed interest in possibly at least looking at that uh, yeah. concept and and uh, I, I don't know for certain I don't believe they, it's not in the bid document I don't now. believe the they're bid not document changing that it's it. sailed, huh? it's, that has sailed I yeah. have um, I asked about a small landscape change, and I was told, <laughs> we're done. <laughs> yeah. So I, I don't believe they included it, Chris. Okay. Um, if we wanted to do it, uh, we might be able to do it by change order, but I think they would say that you pay for all of it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We can go there later. Yeah, just a question. Yeah. Okay, and then the last thing, I guess, is closing Randall Street for halloween -y. Yeah, Halloween is the 31st, which is Wednesday night, a couple of weeks. Um, and uh, the, the practice for the last number of years, probably more than 10, uh, the trustees used to ask, used to close that street uh, from 4 o'clock to 8. Um, they barricaded um, on Elm Street and then on Park Row. Traffic can get down Elm Street to the parking lots and the like, and then on uh, Park Row, they can go into the state complex. Mm -hmm. But Randall Street itself, it's, if you had kids or know of kids, it's, it's a really high, yeah. high traffic area for trick-or-treating, and um, uh, they'd like to have it closed again, so. Yeah, we used to bring our to kids the there when Union Street situation when they were that age. I think it's a good idea. It's safer too. <clears throat> Chris, yes, Everett. Could I clarify one of the comments that I made? Sure. Very briefly. Can they act? On yeah, this they'll first? let us act on this first, real quick, and then right. we'll take care of you. So, Jane, would you like to make a motion? I will make in a that motion respect? to. Okay. Uh, Go forward with the concept of closing Randall Street to traffic on Halloween. From 4 to 8. From 4 to 8 p.m. Thank you. I'll second that. Good. And uh, any further discussion? Doesn't seem to appear, appear to be any, so all those in favor say aye then. Aye. aye. Thank you. Aye. Ever. Just quick like, when the trustees in the village was in existence, the trustees meetings were most of the time at seven or seven thirty at night. Every other one occasionally was at four thirty in the afternoon. So realistically it would not be costing any more money than it was costing before. And what I want to clarify, there are people in the town of Waterbury who have village water. It would be nice if they had access to knowing what's going on with the Farah utility district in terms of costs. And also uh, Skip was very much opposed to this. But that's why they always held the meetings at 4.30 in the afternoon. Many people who would attend those, and as you can see, this the mob here tonight, as usual, myself, and <laughs> anything with me tonight. But I think it would be advantageous if we had the for our district meetings recorded as the trustees were in the past, and skip so somebody's not going to get up at 8, 7.30, 8 o'clock on Monday morning to watch it. That's not the purpose. The purpose of it is to have it in a record form, and if people want to come to the meeting, they can. And if they want to question the minutes, they have access to those. And I just think it's a good idea uh, that both the ruling bodies, if you will, select board and the commissioners of the Farrar District are recorded. And if they are willing to do so. So that's so, so an so issue for my the question. district. Mm. What's that, Bill? I, I understand Everett's reason for bringing it here tonight. There are people who live in outside of the district who are water customers of the district, just like they used to live outside the village. Uh, Everett has made this request to the EFUD board. 
uh, didn't go well the other day for a variety of reasons, but they've put it on their agenda for the next meeting to consider it, and this is a decision for the EFUD board. If you want to send a message encouraging them to do so, you're entitled to do that, but you can't make it happen. Yeah, I was kind of considered. I was kind of thinking that that was the case. Um, I wasn't suggesting that you could force them to do it. Right. Uh, Recommendation, perhaps. Now, obviously, you're asking for them to pay and to 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 record those meetings, correct? Same as they're doing with the board of trustees. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right, Everett. Thank you for your service. Thanks for coming. Motion to adjourn, please. I'll make a motion to adjourn. I'll second that. Okay. All those in favor of getting out of here, say aye. 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 Thank you, Ann. <laughs>